Where are we a month to the day after the atrocities committed in South Israel by 3,000 Gaza Palestinians? Wait a minute, you say. These were not Gaza Palestinians. These were, these were Hamas fighters and militants, or maybe terrorists, depending on your predilection. I disagree. I'm using the phrase Gaza Palestinians or Palestinians from Gaza rather than the habitual Hamas, because by now it has become clear that civilians from Gaza and criminals from Gaza who breached the fence on October 7th, they are the ones who committed most of the heinous crimes against civilians. Hamas terrorists, by comparison, were relatively disciplined throughout the 12 to 24 hours incident. And yes, it took the hallowed and hollowed IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, that long to reach the scene in any meaningful way. In the meantime, Israel found out to its chagrin and shock that Hamas is actually an organized army with a vast arsenal, a network, multi-layered network of tunnels, a second city underground. And it is hierarchical, it is organized, it is fully funded, it has modern weapons, and it, has, it comprises anywhere between 30 and 40,000 fighters. 10,000 of which are the hard nucleus, including a relatively well-equipped and well-trained commando force. This shocked Israel. It's another intelligence failure. It also means that Israel's chances to eradicate Hamas are non-existent. Israel dawdled for three unnecessary and costly weeks before it mustered the courage and determination to invade the aerially devastated Gaza Strip. A stream of triumphant messages followed the ground invasion, but reality and self-congratulatory propaganda rarely meet. In actuality, only 2 to 3 percent of the fighting force and the tunnels of Hamas have been destroyed. Hamas is even more present in the south near Egypt than in the much bombarded and invaded north. It's unclear why Israel is making this distinction between north and south, unless it's, it wants to avoid a true conf confrontation with Hamas. Deep inside and in closed quarters, closed rooms, Israelis admit that Hamas is not the problem. Hamas is a malignancy. It is a sick psychopathic organization. But it is a growth, the tumor that reflects a disease. And the disease is the occupation of millions of Palestinians by Israel. This occupation is unsustainable as Israel is discovering to its cost. And Israel's unwillingness to negotiate a settlement or a solution to the occupation is what gives rise to sickos, psychopaths, musculars like Hamas. I'm talking about the military wing of Hamas, the military arm, headed by the arch-psychopath Sinwar a murderous thug. Hamas is still firing rockets at Israel. It is still holding on to the hostages. It is far from capitulating. Hamas is taunting Israel daily. International grassroots support for Israel is being sorely tested by what is beginning to be widely perceived as its campaign of war crimes against Gazans. So what is Israel to do? Having placed itself 
impossible goals, having backed itself into a rhetorical corner, Israel must now declare victory and negotiate a ceasefire, replete with the release of all civilian hostages held by various groups in Gaza. There is actually no other solution. But this is very unlikely to happen. The rhetoric has taken over. The grandiose megalomaniacal statements have acquired a life of their own. Reality is denied, and Israel is encased in a fantasy, a shared fantasy, a common clinical feature of pathological narcissism. Israel is led by a kleptocracy of grandiose malignant narcissists and petty criminals immured in fantasies and led by Netanyahu, whose only priority is and always has been Netanyahu. The political echelons of Israel are estranged from the people. Israel is actually in the throes of slow motion, simmering revolutionary civil war, which may erupt at any minute. Definitely after this pseudo war is over. Let's, let's be clear about things. My criticism of Israel's strategy, of its choice to collectively punish the population of Gaza, which technically is a war crime and a crime against humanity. My criticism of Israel for its inability to face reality and to be courageous enough and brave enough to admit its vulnerabilities and its need for peace. My criticism is not a vindication of Hamas. The military arm of Hamas, not the Dawah, not the social arm, but the military arm, is a fanatical and tyrannical death cult headed by arch psychopaths and serial killers who propagate their own brand of faux, fake Islam. For example, yet a second time in this short video, Sinwar. The political leadership of Hamas is more sane and grounded, but it is equally trapped in fantasies of revenge and restoration. This war is between two fantasies. It's a fantastical war hyper-realism of some kind, surrealism, if you wish. And yet, unlike Al-Qaeda and ISIS, Daesh, Hamas is supported by 31 to 53% of the Palestinian population, depending on the year. Palestinian population have little to lose and even less to hope for. They can't look forward to anything. There's no forward. There's no future. They barely have a present. And their past is being denied time and again. So they live, Palestinians inhabit, a temporal and spatial no man's land. And they are ripe for the picking by the likes of Hamas. The same way the German people were ripe for the picking by the Nazis after the horrendous defeat in the Second World War. But Al-Qaeda has been an elite organization of operatives. ISIS has never been supported by the local population. The local population detested ISIS. The local population were occupied by ISIS, the same way the Palestinians are occupied by Israel. And yes, Israel is occupying the Palestinians. <laughs> the Palestinian Authority and Gaza Strip autonomy these are jokes, of course. Israel is in charge. Israel controls all the faucets, everything incoming and everything outgoing. So Hamas, unlike ISIS, is a grassroots movement. It is supported by the local population, the same way the majority of the German people supported the Nazis. Goldhagen's famous book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, could be easily retitled Sinwars, Sinwar's willing executioners. It will therefore be impossible to eliminate, eradicate Hamas the way the West 
has dealt with ISIS, for instance. The only way to destroy Hamas irrevocably and irretrievably is to kill all the Palestinians in Gaza. Not all, maybe, but the majority of them. In any fight between a psychopath and a narcissist, the psychopath wins. Narcissists are no match for psychopaths. And here I see a clash between a psychopath, Hamas, and a narcissist, Israel. Narcissists at heart are rather cowardly, or at least reticent. They're pro-social. Narcissists play by some rules. Narcissists are externally regulated. They derive their self-image and self-deception by large degree from the outside. Narcissists are driven by fantasy. They have an impaired reality testing. They're cognitively distorted. They're grandiose. They have paranoid ideation. Consequently, narcissists are very gullible. And their reactions are either too late or disproportional. Psychopaths. Putin comes to mind, for example. An example of a narcissist would be Erdogan. An example of a psychopath would be Putin. Psychopaths are callous, reckless, disinhibited, defiant, and often sadistic. They couldn't care less, psychopaths, couldn't care less about costs, human costs, financial costs, costs in infrastructure. Who cares? Psychopaths are goal-oriented, and their reality testing is intact. They're good at reading other people. And this insight from clinical psychology does not bode well for Israel. As a state actor, Israel has already gone as rogue as it possibly could. The asymmetry in asymmetrical warfare weighs heavily in favor of terrorist organizations. And now Israel is faced with Hezbollah on the north and Hamas in the south. And these two are terrorist organizations organized as standing armies. They benefit from both, view, both worlds. If Israel knows what's good for it, it will now embark on a peaceful solution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because both camps have adopted maximalist positions. The Jews, the Israelis, now are unlikely to trust the Palestinians after October 7th, and I don't blame them. The Palestinians, on the other hand, with so much bad blood and good blood spilled, are likely to demand to make demands which are totally unacceptable, like the right of return to their, they claim, confiscated lands. Both parties actually want 100% of the territory. What is settlement? Settlement. What are the settlements? Settlements are an encroaching way to take over territory from its rightful owners, may I add. So both parties are now, it's, it's a zero-sum game. One of them is going to end up with the entire territory of Palestine. And the other is going to be ethnically cleansed or become second-class citizens. Israel cannot accede or accept a two-state solution now, because it would require dividing Israel in two. Any corridor, any transport corridor connecting the West Bank to Gaza would cut in Israel in half and would become a source of friction and worse, terrorist attacks. That's out of the question after October 7. And a one-state solution is also impossible because Israel could either be Jewish or democratic in a one-state solution, but never both. The Palestinians would constitute a majority of a, one, of a single state by, two, by 2050. So Israel would cease to be Jewish. Or it would adopt an apartheid regime akin to South Africa. But then it would cease to be democratic and would be even more ostracized and excommunicated by 
the international community and probably by the United States as well. It's an impossible conundrum when two people have competing comprehensive claims for the same tiny postage stamp size piece of land it's the size of New Jersey when two pe two peoples two nations two collectives with a cohesive identity are competing for the same tiny tiny piece of land I fail to see a solution I don't think there is one I don't think there is one I think that's precisely why the con this conflict has been going on at the very least for 100 years and probably 140 years. It's likely to continue to go on for another 100 years should Israel survive. If Israel were to alienate again the rest of the Arab world and the Muslim world, for example, Turkey, Pakistan, it would be faced with a formidable existential challenge. And braggadocio and swaggering and boasting aside, there's only that much the Israeli Defense Forces can do, as it as has been proven conclusively on October 7th. 